Well, we're pulling up here on Jake's day. Should be a great day for this. Should uh, got perfect weather for this. Highs in the middle 70s, so couldn't ask for a better day. So uh, we're gonna make the best out of, it, out of it today and have a lot of fun and get to get to know and meet a lot of a lot of people up here. So I hope you all enjoy it just as much as we do. TV. For TV. <laughs> for TV. And then we'll Anytime, buddy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, Jack Brood here. I'm with Greg Sanders here from Randolph County Longbeards. And Greg's going to tell us a little bit about uh, Jake's Day here. Well, Jake's Day is our uh, event to try to get the kids and introduce them into the outdoors. Uh, we do different things with them, like uh, teach them how to fish. Um, we do stuff like shotgun shooting, uh, let them shoot at some clay pigeons out here. Um, do some 22 shoots. We bring the conservation department in from the state of Missouri. Um, kind of let them do some gun safety and different things with them, help teach them a little bit about it. So uh, it's a good way to get them in, introduced to the outdoors, kids that maybe don't have the chance to get that opportunity, you know, with uh, having people that would take them out and do that kind of stuff. So. And also this year they had uh, Chris Parrish here for to give a seminar on on uh, how to turkey hunt and basically give a seminar on on getting kids in and and the youth involved into the outdoors. So uh, y'all have this annually, right? Yeah, we do it every year, uh, about the same time every year. Um, every year we try to get somebody new to come in and speak. Uh, you know, we got to give a big shout out to Chris. Uh, he was excellent with the kids today. Um, came up and gave them a little demonstration, uh, told some stories. Um, you know, he's got a great background, a great story. Um, you know, all the world turkey calling champions, that championships that he's won. Um, you know, something kind of neat for the kids to come up and get introduced to somebody that, you know, made it in the outdoors and, and, and meet somebody like that. So. And, and especially to have someone that's made it that far in the outdoors and to be from Missouri. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's kind of a big deal. You know, he's just from right up the road. Uh, been, I think he said 35, 35 years or something like that. He's been in the outdoors, uh, turkey calling, uh, started out with turkey calling, moved into production of his own calls. He works for Night and Hail Turkey Calls now. So, uh, you know, he's been doing it for 35 years. So this was his last year and he just retired. So, yeah, definitely getting somebody from Missouri that, you know, kids that can relate to. And it makes a big difference. Here, but th these calls... See how high pitched that is? But I can take my hand and lay on that. I can change the tone of it. 
strikers make the call sound different. See that's deeper in tone? And the reason why we carry a lot of these calls is because one call may not be what a turkey answers, but you pick up two or three different calls or a couple different strikers and hit, all of a sudden that turkey answers that particular sound and pitch and tone. That may be what he's attracted to and what gets him killed. So we want to make sure we've got plenty of plenty of ammo there. But that's a pot style call. <laughs> but on a mouth call, the biggest key to teaching these kids how to use a mouth call is properly fitting them and getting the right call to start with. And I recommend a double read. I don't recommend a single read because a single read takes a lot of tongue manipulation to get that high low note. A double read takes very little because as you put pressure and it's a straight reeded call, there's no cuts, as you put pressure on the reed, the straight reed will give you a higher note. And as you drop your tongue slightly off of that, the lower reed then kicks in and gives you the deeper note. So it naturally has that high low that a turkey's voice is made up of. Now, turkeys are much different in sound, but most of them have a high low note to it. So if I'm gonna get that high note, I'm gonna put that call in my mouth, I'm gonna push my tongue into it. Now this is a cut call, so it's gonna have a little rasp even with the high note, okay? I'm gonna get that high note, and then I'm gonna drop my jaw slightly, which brings the pressure of my tongue off the reed. Doesn't necessarily bring my tongue off the reed. It brings the pressure of my tongue off the reed, which deepens the note. Now, that sounds a little bit like a sick chicken, but if I put that together, and learn how to say the word chick or chuck or even yelp. I'm trying, I'm sounding more like a turkey. A chick, chuck. It's a different turkey. Now I'm going to say the word yelp. Now you notice I'm moving my jaw and my mouth. When you watch an old hen's mouth, she's like this when she's calling. And then you get close to her and watch her. And if you guys now to have these cameras that are out there filming every time and hunting, you get an old hen comes up there, film her up close, because when you watch her yelp, especially when she's really getting into it, her whole body will move. She, her whole diaphragm area will move. Learn how to do that with a call. I'm going to show you why, because it makes you sound more and more real. The more you can do it like real turkeys do it, the more real you sound. For years, the big thing was, is, well, I don't want to make any movement, so this call doesn't, doesn't you know, I, I can use a mouth call and I don't get any movement out of it. And I want, to, I want you to listen to the difference. So, I got my gun up. Trust me. On the right day, that'll kill any turkey in the woods. However, now if I use a little more jaw manipulation, I'm getting a little more real. Now if I'm gonna call a little bit more, I'm gonna try to use my diaphragm and everything. I'm gonna bring it all the way up and I'm gonna try to call like, like they're doing by using, pushing, I'm not using my vocal cords but I'm still using my throat. I'm bypassing air and, and stopping the use of my vocal cords. It's kind of like ventriloquism to a point, but I'm not a ventriloquist. I can barely talk English. I see my, my belly moving. Now I'm able to really control that rhythm and how that that sound comes out of there. And by doing that, I can really make sure that that call sounds real. But using a friction call is the same way. You know, instead of just learning how to run the call and making noise with it, really learn to know the call and know every little aspect of that call and how to make it get soft, how to make it get loud, and how to be able to call with this thing when you in your when you're blindfolded so that you can run that thing in the heat of the moment without any kind of mistakes or very minimal mistakes because then you'll have confidence turkeys make mistakes all the time i don't know if you call them mistakes i think it's just they speak and have hiccups just like we do when we talk but 
what I recommend is, is kids, if you're learning how to do this and dads teach them to do this, lay that call down and close your eyes completely tight. Learn how to pick that call up and feel your way through it <laughs> until you can do that blindfolded. That way in the heat of the moment when your gun's up, you can just pick that call up. You don't have to worry about knowing what's going on with that call. You can run that call and have total confidence because as a hunter, the more confidence you have in yourself, your ability, your shooting ability, guys that shoot a bow, and I know Lucas has a, a archery shop out here and they've been, I used to shoot there years ago when I actually had time to, to do something, but I try to shoot about every other day at my house because that's where my office is so I can step outside and shoot a few, tar few arrows. But if the more confident you are in what you're doing, the more successful you'll be because you'll stay in there, you will hunt longer, you will hunt harder, and you'll believe in yourself. It's no different than doing your schoolwork. It's no different than going out and getting a job. It's no different than, than doing anything in this world. The more confident you are, the better you are at it, the more successful you will be at anything that you do. And so with hunting, it's the same way. With this taxidermy work, you know, it took him, what, 45 minutes to sit down there and do that completely right. Now, he could have halfway done that. He could have sat there and halfway got that clean and been okay. But then when he sold that to a customer, if something would have went wrong, he'd have known down deep in his soul that he didn't do his job 100% correct. And so everything you do, I'm kind of giving you a sermon here, but everything you do transfers into that. And I'm saying that because I'm, I'm a 45-year-old business owner that I aspired when I was 13 years old. And I told my dad, and he looked at me and said I was completely nuts, that I was going to build turkey calls and I was going to do something in the hunting industry. That was my goal when I was 13 years old. And when I was 19 years old, I know, let's see here, when I was 22 years old, working at AB Chance Company, I made up my mind that I was gonna get started on building a business and really learn how to do things right. Because I was a machinist, I could do a little bit of government work on the side, so we built machines to be able to build mouth calls with. And I learned how to, I went to school and learned how to, to be a job, got a journeyman's card, and I also learned drafting, so I knew drawing, and was able to do my own drawings, and I kept aspiring, had that dream in my mind all the time, what I wanted to do. When I was about 23 years old, I had stated this a couple of times at work, and everybody I co-worked with thought I was completely nuts. Well, when I turned about 26, I would built my business up to where it was making as much money as a living as I was making there, and I had to make a choice. And I quit my day job, my factory job, and ever since then I've done nothing but work in this industry. So you can do what you want to do with your life. It's Ooh, Did you hear that turkey call? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <It's all demanding. laughs> I still have pretty good hearing out of one side of my ear. <laughs> but what I'm trying to tell you guys is, is this kind of funny that I have something to do with building mouth calls and it's kind of goofy that I got my start in turkey calling. But if you desire to do something in any kind of industry, anything at all, don't let anybody tell you you can't do it because you can do whatever you want to do. All you got to do is put your mind to it and have a little bit of support. And with you kids out here and these fathers out here supporting you in hunting and the outdoors, um, I mean, to me, that's that's as close to near and dear to my heart as it gets. I've got a 10-year-old kill his first turkey last year. And uh, probably the most patient turkey in the world. Obviously, the good Lord wanted that turkey to die because he would not leave. But... Uh, you know, he wouldn't he wouldn't shoot the turkey. The turkey was in on top of us for two hours off and on constantly. Got to watch the turkey actually breed a hen and I wouldn't explain that. And the turkey went on off and came back and finally went on off again. I, I finally called the gobbler back in and when he made his mind up he was gonna shoot that turkey and he was sitting in a chair in a blind with me. And his heart would you get some paper and get yeah, those guys right, right there? Yep. And his heart got to beating against my chest. That's what reminded me what it was like when I first started turkey hunting. And so, this day and age, to me, it's all about taking somebody. I've been blown, I've hunted 32 states in the U.S. I've watched enough turkeys die to fill this building. It's, <laughs> I've, been, I've been around, I've seen, seen that movie, been there, got the t-shirt to it. But watching a child kill their turkey, or, or a, a young girl, or a lady, a wife, shoot their first turkey that they've because they've never hunted before my wife had never picked up a gun in her life
17 years ago. She killed her first turkey, and I remember it in the fall of the year, it was a big gobbler. And I uh, called in four long beards, and she shot one of them. <clears throat> and I'm carrying the turkey, because she's not packing this 18-pound turkey out. I'm packing the turkey out for her, and she's walking behind me. And it's pretty leaves, leaves are pretty crunchy, and it's just about dark. And I'm walking along, and I can hear her walking and me walking, and all of a sudden I hear her stop. And we're coming down this big, beautiful hill. It's just a gorgeous little deal. And I stop, I turn around, and I look, and I go, what's wrong? And she goes, she's looking around. She goes, now I know why you hunt. So she figured it out. It didn't take her long to figure out, you know. I mean, that's about as close to God as you're going to get until our, we get called home. So that's the one thing I love about hunting is it's the one time you can be at peace with everything and nobody can bother you most of the time. So here, um, okay. on your turkey, when you do like your uh, calling championships, they have like certain levels that you have to do, like, uh, you know, start out with a like, tree cluck. I mean, do they have different... Yeah, it, the way it normally like works, the way it normally works is unless you've won a Grand Nationals, you have to go qualify. You have to call in a state or a regional type of event that's sanctioned by the NWTF. And after you do that, you're qualified to go to the Nationals. You don't have to go call in it. But then you have, you know, all these contests have an entry fee. Grand Nationals happens to have a, 20, a $250 entry fee for a chance to win around $5,000. Uh, because of that, I got to go on the David Letterman show and uh, a couple of times I've got to go on Fox News in New York. I've spent a lot of time in New York. I have to do a lot of things that I've never been able to do, you know, because of it. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of the uh, radio show that I did there that I'm actually he treated us pretty good, but I'm not real proud I got to go on a show. Uh, he's one of the judges on that uh, Howard Stern. Howard Stern, yeah, I did the Howard Stern show. Um, you know, I was really surprised. He was really good with us, but. Uh, you know, I did that just because it was a sponsorship thing. I felt like I had to do it for our sponsors that were, were given the money. Um, the thing that, that with the calling is, is you're a number. You draw a number out of a hat. And on that particular day, there's anywhere from five to seven different calls that they have written down. And it could be a tree call, fly down cackle, uh, old hen assembly yelp, cluck and purr, uh, gobbler yelp. It could be a multitude of things. And those five calls, you have to perform, and an MC will say, caller number one, give me, you know, your version of a, a tree call. So you've got to give your version of a tree call. It's like turkey, really early in the morning, waking up, giving the soft yelps and clucks. And so you, you do all those calls, and you're judged from zero to 20 on that. And once your scores are tabulated, they take the high score and the low score, and they throw it out, and the middle three scores, depending on how many judges there are, the middle three or the middle five scores are the scores that actually get counted. And then that's who decides the winner. And um, I've been fortunate enough to be on, I think Kathleen and I, I retired this year. This was my retirement year. I finally called it quits. I figured winning another one. I, I, I placed in every championship this year I could in the top, uh, every one of them that there was in the top five and I won another world championship. So. I decided I'm going to go out with a bang. I'm done. 33 years of calling. If I won 100 more of them, my career is made. And besides that, I can tell you guys, <clears throat> if you all have ever played sports and you watch these pro golfers, for example, you know, back when Jack Nicklaus was in his prime, he never made mistakes. And then you saw him get in his late 30s, and he just had to work his rear end off to contend. Well, up until about four years ago, you couldn't make me make a mistake. I'm telling you, you could throw a chair across the room, you could turn the lights out, you could do whatever, and I would not make a bobble. In the last four years, every now and again in a contest, I'd just lose my train of thought and make a little slip. You know what that is? That's age. <laughs> Concentration's not there like it was when I was younger. So, so I thought, you know what? If I have one more really good year, I'm going to go out and slide out of there on top and just be done with it and have fun. I may do some judging and stuff like that, but we sat down the other night and figured up because I'd kept kind of a track record. And uh, I had called in like 127 turkey calling contests in my career, and I had won 89 of them. And I placed in the top five in 97 of them. So... That's a, that's a pretty strong career. Yeah. I wish they would have been in golf or something that actually paid <laughs> money. However, 
I did well with it and it did me did me well in my life so it's what I chose to do but you know that's just one of those little and, and the perks that's gone along with it the things that I've been able to do some of the hunts I've been able to go on at, at no charge and the people I've got to meet just like yourselves I mean that's what it's all about it's about the camaraderie you know hunting to me as I deer hunt as, as a bow hunter and an elk hunter sometimes it kind of gets to be a, a, a one-man sport to a point pretty tough to kill big deer when you got a multitude of people around. It's, it's tough to hunt a big bull elk, especially when you got a cameraman around and you you got to move and you got to get going on one. But turkey hunting to me is a sport about camaraderie and sharing it with other people. And there's nothing more fun for me to be back there 60 yards and having a father and son set up in front of me and him sitting between his dad's leg and yelp that gobbler up or any kind of turkey up that he chooses to shoot and him kill that first turkey. Yeah. To me, that's that's what it's all about. That's where that's where everything, it's come full circle for me. You know, I'm still a little bit greedy with my deer except for my son, but when it comes to turkey hunting, I care less if I ever shoot another one. I've, I've been there and done that and, you know, it's, to me it's about watching these guys come up. So. Guys, if, if you ever want to, to get your kids in the outdoors or just have a fun event for one weekend, this is a great event, and you'll get to see our, our footage of it, and you'll get to see a lot of what they do here. So next year when they have this, we'll, we'll put up the flyers and everything, but I, I highly recommend you bring your kids out here. To, and It's a really good time, and we enjoyed the food, enjoying the camaraderie about, about you know hunters and, and people and everything else. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think we got to give a big shout-out to Gun Creek Outfitters. Um, you know, uh, Roy and Fadre family uh, letting us come up here and use the facilities every year. They've done it for the last couple of years for us. You know, that's really helpful. Um, you know, give a big shout out to uh, Bass Pro. They did a lot for donations to us. Um, the, you know, Missouri NWTF chapter, they, a lot of the different items that they donated to us, you know, and we really appreciate you guys coming up and, you know, giving us a chance to get, kind of reach out to some of the other people that don't know about this going on. So. Sure. And I'll tell you what, guys, we, we enjoyed the heck out of it this weekend. And stay tuned, and I hope you all get to enjoy it next year when they have it. <laughs> what? Oh, oh, you're we, we really probably ought to do the real one now. That's <laughs>